Hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, wonderful Find My Pass from Home session. And this is a really, really special one. I can see so many of you waiting to join and to say hello to our fantastic panel of celebrities that you might have seen across the country and across the world as we've been talking about the biggest event in not just family history, but in history. I don't think there's been a larger event in the thousands of years that history has been recorded. It is the launch of the 1921 census for England and Wales. And and who better to join me than we have Brian Donovan, Paul Nixon, Rose Stavely Wadham, and Audrey Collins. We've got experts from around um, the National Archives and Farm My Past to tell us everything that we might need to know. And some of them have even been to bed. It's been one of those things. I'd love to hear um, if people can give comments as well, if they have stayed up to enjoy all of the 1921 census as soon as the clock struck midnight. It's been a bit of a Cinderella story, but no one turned into a pumpkin here. It is nothing but wonderful finds, and we'd love to hear what other finds you've had too. So um, with that quick brief introduction, as we're all so excited and seeing everyone saying hello from all over the world, not just Britain, but Canada, America, elsewhere too, um, what has everyone found so far in the 1921 census? I'm sure you've all had time to go and explore and take a look at the wonderful records that are now online for the first time. Anyone found anything really exciting? <laughs> Tangle. <laughs> Great stuff. Okay. Well, that's yeah, just, okay. there's so many finds that they've stunned you into silence. That's good. Paul, what was, what was the the biggest thing you found so oh far? Oh my gosh, I found I found I found all four grandparents. Um, I, I had three grandparents who appeared on the 1911 census, but my maternal grandmother um, was born uh, later, so she she appears on the 1921 census. But I found all of them, all four grandparents, um, and I've been looking at them and looking at. Um, soldiers as well uh, soldiers who returned from the first world war um and were have been disabled uh, and, and were forging new careers and new lives uh you know having having come back from the war so it's fascinating really absolutely fascinating it's, it's really good as well it's, it's, it's good that you can look up not just families but also you know things that you've got an interest in house history locations and you know i know you're you're really big on military history some of your presentations and things probably um, might have a, a little bit of a, a chance for a rework now we've got more information with the 1921 census it might uh, might be really good to add more detail so that's really exciting anything really surprising in there uh, for me, I, well, talking about 1921 census, Mick, I hadn't even finished going through 1911 with my research for the <laughs> soldiers, so I've, I've got a lot of catching up to do. But no, I just, um, I, I've been particularly interested in St Dunstan's, the men of St Dunstan's recently, those men who were blinded, and, and looking at um, what they were doing after they came back, looking at the new careers. So a lot of men became poultry farmers or uh, became masseurs, um, basket weaving, um, all, all sorts of careers. So it's just interesting to see how they uh, reshaped their lives. Um, and often in a very positive positive way. I mean, blind, uh, St Dunstan's taught men how to be blind. Uh, men had to learn how to be blind. And, and you see that in the census. You see them uh, getting back into society. So it's tragic, but, but interesting at the same time. Wow, that's really, really big. Uh, Rose, what have you found? Anything exciting too? Um, I think my most exciting find was finding out who lived in my house in um, 1921. Um, I live in one of the um, early uh, council blocks uh, in London. And uh, so it was it was built in 1920 and I was able to find uh, the inhabitants of the house. And um, they're a young couple, one of them employed uh, on the docks and the other one, um, she was a, a toffee wrapper, a sweet factory, oh. which I thought was lovely. And I just love the way that it mirrored um, my present. I'm, I'm living here with my partner. Um, we're around the same age. Uh, and I, I found that my most sort of moving uh, find, actually. And I, I wasn't expecting to be so moved by the house history. I was expecting maybe the family history, which was amazing to see my relatives. But just to see who was living in my house and what their experience was 100 years ago, just absolutely fascinating. It is. Yeah, it's, 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 it's so strange the the parallels between 1921 and today we you know we've got the uh, coronavirus and the spanish flu you've got lots of industrial unrest and rampant inflation and people not trusting their political leaders there's all kinds of other things that just sort of seem like it's it's almost like we're looking at the same day so it's, it's really really interesting and uh, it's, it's amazing to see it and see what our ancestors did when they were in that sort of period um, Audrey, um, I don't know if you've got any of your own ancestors in 1921, but I'm sure you've been looking up 
plenty of great things. Nico, you know perfectly well I haven't got any ancestors at all in 1921. Um, yeah, all, all of mine were, were still in Scotland then, so I can be entirely professional uh, looking at 1921. But I did find uh, my house for the first time. It was built in 1919. And um, rather like Rose, that, that, that was rather nice because um, the, I knew exactly who was going to be there. There's a 12-year-old girl called Nellie Green, and I knew she would be there because um, I've been in the house uh, a bit less than 20 years. My next door neighbor has been there nearly twice as long. And the elderly Nellie Green, who never married, lived in that house nearly all her life. Uh, she was still there when they moved in. So I actually had a connection with, with somebody. So I, I know somebody who met uh, Nellie Green and that was rather nice. And my house and next door, it's a little pair of cottages and uh, we were told that they were built for the, um, the supervisors who worked in the boot factory on the corner. And of course, with the employer, yes, this was absolutely correct. They were uh, managers of some kind in the Britannia Bootworks, um, which uh, used to be on the corner. So that, that it was nice to have that confirmed. Everything I'd been told turned out to be true. And that doesn't always happen. So that, that was nice. And I did find... Um, because I have no ancestors there, but I did find all four of my ex-husband's uh, grandparents within about 10 minutes, and one of them was called uh, William Brown, so um, just shows sometimes you can. That's brilliant. And uh, Brian, um, I know you might not have any ancestors in the 1921 census either, but what I would you have you thought so too, but that's not <laughs> the case. I mean, you know, oh. being based in Ireland and being of Irish ancestry, I would have thought nobody's going to be there. But in fact, three of my four grandparents are in the 1921 census, one Irish, one Scottish and one Canadian. Uh, so um. I think that's one of the, the big stories about the 1921 census of England and Wales is it actually gives you a really clear idea of just how international the country was becoming. Mm -hmm. um, there are 1.2 million people, uh, three and a half percent of the population who were born in a different country. Now, admittedly, a large proportion of them were Irish and quite, quite a few of them were Scottish too. But there's also large cohorts coming from what was then the Indian Empire, which is much larger than was India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma, mm -hmm. uh, Myanmar, and, and so on, wider afield. The single largest group from Europe who were there were actually Russians. There was uh, 40,000 Russians living in, in, in England at the time of, 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 of Russian birth, I should say. And that doesn't mean they're just that's the only group at all, because, of course, there's people who've been first generation and so on. So it's really interesting looking at that. And that's what I've been digging into a bit recently. Yeah, that patchwork is fantastic. And, and, and as you've been saying about digging into things, and I know, Brian, I, I remember seeing you as, as this launched at midnight, we had people in the office working around the clock to make sure everything went smoothly and wonderful. But I, I wanted to maybe look at just how big a project this was. And I think, Rose, you're probably best place to tell us more about just the amount of effort that went into making this, which is why this has been a project three years in the making and, and how we can now at the touch of a button just look at all these wonderful records. Well, I think just to just to begin, stepping in to the Office of National Statistics, which is where the, the actual books of the 1921 register were stored, it was, it was vast. It, it was humbling to see rows upon rows and rows of shelves. Um, so we had a, a wonderful, a dedicated, passionate uh, conservation team who went through every single page of um, the census, millions of pages. Um, you know, their, their work is, is magnificent um, in, in bringing um, bringing to life the, the census and from then we had the, the scanning process again a wonderful dedicated team working with us to make sure um, that the images which are, uh, were, were imaged <laughs> lost my words there in the best possible way and then the next stage transcription 38 million names this is you know that's one of the time-consuming right. elements yeah. too. Um, I was I was sat mostly on a spreadsheet for this project, because that was my role, spreadsheets. Not the most exciting part of the project, admittedly, but tracking the numbers as they were coming in every week, uh, the seeing 100,000 records a week being transcribed. It was a, a mammoth, wonderful task to be a part of. 
That's great. And, and Audrey, I know that the census has been something close to your heart for, for decades. And, and how does it feel that your, your, your baby has been born and oh, uh, yes. see all the wonderful, happy right. stories? And I can see some of them coming in. We'll look at some of them shortly, mm -hmm. of the people that have found great things in the census already and yes. keep telling them what you've found as well while we're, while we're talking. As you know, sorry, Vicar, but, um, you know, I, I was up way, way past my bedtime, obviously. Um, but what was great was, yes, I, I was finding lots of things in the census and having a good explore and a poke around, but I was also following it on Twitter and there were so many people on Twitter going, oh my goodness, this has solved my problem or, oh no, this has opened up, you know, this, this has um, you know, asked more questions and it's solved, so now I've got to go and explore something else. But um, you know, there was an awful lot of, of people uh, you know, just finding ex you know, big things and little things and some of them were surprising and some of them were true then you know it's good to know that that's true and that 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 was almost more fun than the actual census itself and census itself of course is just tremendous fun it's just you know never tire of looking at the census and uh, now having a you know a completely new one to play with it's it's just it's just tremendous fun. That is fantastic. I'm just looking at some of the comments that are coming through. I see uh, Karen Mitchell has found the man she's been looking for. Her grandfather, it's taken her the best part of 30 years to discover his place of birth. Mm. And these are the stories that make it worthwhile, I think. There are so many of these kind of things coming in. See so Rosie saying, it's worth every penny to see my mum with her parents and siblings on the only census they will be together. Uh, there are so many of them as well. Um, coming in we're trying to keep up I've seen so many flying past but uh, it, it is wonderful and um, what about the other records on Pharma Pass so so Paul I know I said you, you know a lot about things like service records and things and newspapers and, and electoral rolls and what can we use to to take from the 1921 census and build more of a family tree well you know I think um, you've got the going back to the military you've got the soldiers returning so um, on some of those service records uh, where, where a man was killed you'll have addresses in 1919 so my grandfather's brother uh, Jack was killed in 1918 and one of the army forms in his service record give, lists all his living relatives at the time all his uh, siblings uh, full blood and half blood there was only full blood in, in that family um, so you get the address in 1919 and then you can compare that with 1921 um, and his I mean the, the Nixon family was uh, of course like many families was um, I won't say broken, but but it certainly went through changes. I mean, they lost one of the, one of the four brothers, one of the sisters uh, married a Canadian serviceman and, and emigrated, and so the family had changed quite a lot in those last three years. But but for the service records, um, or for the for the nineteen twenty one census, it's a it, it fills that gap between uh, nineteen eleven census, which we we already had, and the nineteen thirty nine register, which which we already had. It just brings it on a lot more, and you and you, it's another key. Uh, cornerstone in, in the research, isn't it? The, the census, the BMDs, those those key records, and you you use those records then to then look at all the other records we've got on Farmer Pass and look at newspapers, for that matter as well. So it's it, it's a beginning of a journey. It, it helps complete, I suppose, complete add to what we already have, but it can also start as a begin, you know, serve as a beginning of a journey as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's part of a it's almost like a cornerstone of research and there's just so much to add to it and it just you, we build a massive foundation and uh, it might be a, a shameless plug but you'll you'll see uh, Paul and I and um, we'll, we're going to be wandering the country virtually so from from the comfort of our own homes we're going to visit your homes one by one and give you all the best tips of how to get the most out of the 1921 census some exciting finds uh, a little bit more into how it came to be and uh, so there's going to be a great uh, tour that you can see possibly at your local family history society. There's some details on the blog and on Facebook. Uh, so definitely look out for those dates and, and you might be able to ask a lot of questions as well and, and just hopefully get those missing relatives. But it looks like, again, so many of you have been finding your relatives. Um, there's lots and lots of uh, different things coming through. Um, Frederick says, and this is, might be a question for Audrey, I believe my grandfather was an enumerator in 1921 at Portsmouth. Any tips on how I can find his work? Um, it's tricky, really, because the although the, the, the name of the enumerator will be there, there's no way of knowing for certain what his enumeration district would have been. Um, but, um, and I should know this, but I don't. We have the plans of division, which I was quite pleased to see. You can actually browse independently of the, of, of the household schedules. Um, but I'm not sure if they actually include the name of the enumerator. If they do, that would be a nice quick way of 
scanning through the, the, the districts for, for one particular place. Um, it sometimes is worth searching um, ju just for enumerator as an occupation. It, it's a bit hit and miss, but in previous censuses, sometimes I've found people that admit to being enumerators, and sometimes you, you, you just don't know unless you happen to spot their name at the, um, you know, at the beginning of the book. Um, and I'm thinking, um, you know, I'm just trying to you know, get these, these things in my mind's eye because I'm not looking at them on the computer at the moment. But um, you know, there are a few places where you see the enumerator signature. I would maybe start with the district where he lives um, because you know, he's fairly likely to be in the enumerator for that district, but not necessarily. If he's not there, maybe try looking at some of the neighboring ones. But I think the, the logistics on the ground was that the, you know, the registrar needed a certain number of enumerators. And um, it's never been that easy to recruit enumerators. Some of them were a, a bit on the reluctant side. Mm -hmm. In fact, 20 years ago, um, when I, I was doing some work, I, I was actually the, the, uh, the ONS uh, engaged me as their census historian. And I was asked to, uh, it was the best freelance job ever. I was asked to find lots of interesting things about the census with a good geographical spread. And of course, some of the really interesting things in the census are the comments of the enumerators who are really fed up with a lot of work for not much money and they have to provide their own ink. Uh, and they said, but could you just go a little bit easy on the snarky enumerator comments? Because we're still trying to recruit for, um, for, for the 2001. Um, and that, so some things never change. But I must admit, it, it is absolutely great fun if you find somebody that is an enumerator that you've got some connection with. Uh, so I, I hope you find it, but it might take a while, but uh, it'll be great if you do. That's a, 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 yeah, it's a good point there. Um, Brian, how, if I'm coming to this, if, I've, if I'm have i one of the, the almost 400 people watching right now who is really excited about the 1921 census, and I've, I've watched it on the news, I've seen uh, everyone talking about how wonderful this is, and I, I don't know where to begin, and I want to get started. Where can I see this? How can I use it? And, um, you know, how do I get started? Well, if you want to get to the 1921 census, you have to come to Find My Past um, and log in. You get a free account, register, uh, if you don't have one already. Uh, and we have a lot of free records on the site. You know, always bear that in mind. I mean, you know, um, uh, people always think that simply because we run subscription services or pay-per-view records like this, that it's only about that. No, there's lots of free records there, a lot of free support and help and advice. Read that, read the guides, uh, and then take your first step from there. You need to start with the information you know for certain and work backwards from there. Don't start jumping into, into the unknown without enough, enough information to be sure you're on the right track. You can waste a lot of time doing that. That would be my single biggest piece of advice. And any tips for searching? If I've got maybe the name of my grandparents or something like that, and I'm, I'm trying to dig through, and I know that um, you know, I want to be sure I've got the right person before I, I, I get that record. Is there something? Yeah, there's a number of things you can do. I think you start out by understanding the records you're looking at. Um, these are handwritten by the, 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 the head of household in each individual house. I mean, the quality of the handwriting varied enormously. So as a consequence, the transcription is never going to be perfect. Just accept that to start with. That's just inevitable. And then start broad and get narrow in your research. Don't, don't start looking for absolutely every single forename, surname, the details and everything else you might know in exact dates of birth and so on. Start more broadly and then narrow it down uh, as, as you can find forward. If you're not entirely sure, always look at alternate surnames, alternate forenames. Um, just be open-minded. This is being recorded, as I said, by, by people who, who may have had varying literacy skills. Um, this is also being amended then by enumerators to get things standardized and correct, which they may have had different agenda than you do. Uh, um, but, you know, keep trying is what I would say. Uh, and, and um, you know, just try, try going broad and then narrow afterwards. And uh, in the same sort of vein, uh, there's a, a question I think is, uh, is 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 right up your street, Paul. There's a lot of uh, Nettie's finding a lot of young men who are missing and wondering if there's something to do with their forces service that that might be why they're not in the 1921 census. Is that something you've come across, or something you you might have a a bit of thought behind? Uh, they should be there. Um, 
I would have thought, um, because the army was enumerated uh, in the 19, well, and the navy for that matter, in the 1921 census. Um, so, so you'll find the army in um, in Ireland. You'll you'll find the army overseas in India and in, and in the colonies uh, that existed in 1921 still. So they so they should be there. Um, it, but it's a good point about uh, about these men. Um, if you've looked for your First World War serviceman and have not found a service record, um, it could be that he was still serving in the army. Um, and if, if that's the case, th the records will still be with the MOD. Um, but you might find that same man that, that uh, for whom you couldn't find a service record serving in the army now in 1921. So, but but generally, um, if he was in the army, uh, serving in the army, he should be there in the 1921 census. It's not like the 1939 register, which was a... a, a mm -hmm. A register of the civilian population where you won't find servicemen but in the 1921 census you should do so uh, the say, Army. Uh, sorry uh, audrey yeah i uh, just say about when i was thinking about the army um that in this census you will find if anybody was in the army you will find them whether they were in india or in in, in england and wales and ireland you'll find them everywhere except if they were in scotland True. Um, they were the uh, they'd be the only army barracks that would not be included in this census, um, which is oh, I guess nowhere near as many as as the barracks in Ireland or or, or in England. Um, but uh, you know that that's that's the only bit of the army uh, that that you won't find in this census, which which only actually occurred to me a couple of days ago. So, um, yeah, it's a good point, Mika. Can I just add something? Um, you yeah. when you were asking Brian about uh, his his tips on. Um, finding people in the census. I mean, one thing that everyone should bear in mind, and which I'll be mentioning in my talks, the first one of which, by the way, is tomorrow at 7 a.m. for New Zealand, for anyone in New Zealand who's <laughs> tuning in. Um, the um, There's extensive notes which um, our colleague Stephen Rigdon has written um, on the 1921 census. So if you go to the Learn More link, so click on 1921 census um, and go to the advanced search where you see all those boxes. But I would just say resist the temptation to dive straight in and find find out more about the census look look mm -hmm. at the learn more section look at the search tips look at the useful links um, and, and really read that because steve has spent a lot of time um putting together extensive notes um and which includes some real uh, great nuggets of information so just I, I do think it's worthwhile looking at that first and then uh, making notes and then and then doing the search pretty good point paul i think that's it i think i think before we we leave we'll all have to give our our top tip for finding things because i think everyone can can always do with a little bit more advice and i think that this is possibly uh, one of the the biggest rooms of expertise that i think we'll ever gather together particularly for this momentous occasion so it's a great chance to, to do that and i can still see uh, lots and lots of questions and comments coming through um rose the census has your parents, grandparents, great grandparents, all kinds of people that we might know and be related to. But what about the big names? What about the people of the 1920s, the celebrities, the interesting finds that are lurking in these pages because it's such a big document? Oh, well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked me about this, Miko, because I have been enjoying looking up the celebs of the era. Um, I've just been, I wrote myself a list of all the people I wanted to be, wanted to find. Um, so, of course, there's, there's the king himself, uh, King George V, because everyone was um, enumerated. Um, so it's wonderful to see um, him and uh, the royal family. Um, my own particular favourite find was um, a young Vivian Lee. Um, she was at a boarding school, um, she, Vivian Hartley. Um, she was born in India, but she'd been sent over to um, a Roman Catholic boarding school. So I was, I was absolutely uh, delighted to find her. There's, there's an old Thomas Hardy. Um, gosh, there, there are just so many from from politics, from literature, who, whoever you're sort of really passionate and interested in, sportsmen, sportswomen. Um, I found the um, oldest ever woman to win a gold medal at a, an Olympics, um, Queenie Newell. Uh, she she was I think she was 54 or 53 when she won gold. Uh, so that that was wonderful to find. So from from the big names to the the, the just all wonderful stuff. <laughs> Great. I've, I've just uh, seen a comment there from Cheryl that Vivian Lee is one of her favourites. And um, 
Yeah, another comment from Nicola. She's already found Agatha Christie as well. So it looks like a few other people are digging through for their favourite celebrities. And uh, it is is wonderful to to be able to. I know it's it's your favourite phrase, Audrey, about peering into the windows of people's houses on, on census night. And it's great that we're, we're able to do that with such a really big collection that's on Find My Past. So it's, it is really, really exciting. This is finally here. And I know that we've been waiting so long for it with something that's taken so long to create because it's just so big. Uh, let's have a look at the comments and questions and see if there are any more interesting things that people have been finding and see if we can take a look. Uh, so there are so many. We're moving so quickly. So there's 400 of you in here today. And um, it's just going all the way through. Jane has a good uh, comment about um, employment. I think there's a lot we can say about jobs and employment in the census. Is there a guide to the employer codes in the 1921 census, not occupations which are found already? And I, I know that when you go and look at your uh, entry on the 1921 census, the transcript has been enhanced in a number of different ways. And we will tell you a little bit about the employment code that is given to your ancestors' employment to give you an idea of what it is. There are plenty of weird and wonderful employee, uh, employment terms that you may never have heard of. The knocker-upper is one of my particular favourites. So those people that wake people up in the days before alarm clocks with the uh, pea shooters or rubber hammers on the windows, anything like that. And there are still knocker-uppers in 1921. So uh, they still have quite active employment and there are many, many more as well. So really interesting ones to see if you're looking, you need a bit more information with those employment codes. They are in the transcript. But that brings us to employment itself because the 1921 census has some amazing details about employment, places to to work people are working in in different ways and we can almost see uh, I know we've heard of one place studies and one name studies one job studies and things like that as for the first time because of the things that the 1921 census brings us uh, and uh, Paul what uh, does this show about 1920s Britain when we look at something like that new column oh I just think um, for the first time you can see uh, again using my um, my family as an example. So the, so the Nixons, uh, I, I knew they worked for a company called Carter Patterson, uh, which was a haulage company. Um, they they lived in Stoke Newington in Hackney. Um, and there was a Carter Patterson in Goswell Road, not very far away from where our office is actually now in London. Um, but there was also one in Stoke Newington. So, so, for, so for the first time, I can see that um, two of the two of the brothers uh, worked at the Stoke Newington branch, logically. Um, and my maternal uh, great-grandfather, uh, was a labourer still at the age of 65, commuting from uh, East London down to down to Woolwich. Uh, <laughs> heaven forbid that I would, well, you say that, not that far off, 65 for that matter. But, uh, but you know, working as a labourer, it's a hard life. You know, these people lived hard lives. And mm. um, I, I just, um, but the beauty of it is, is that now, the, you know, for, for Carter Patterson, for instance, if I wanted to, I could do a search on, on Carter Patterson and find out who, my, my grandfather and his brother worked with. I can find the other people who work for the same company at the same location. So, so that is all new, uh, and it's it's a huge uh, additional bonus, I think, for anybody who's uh, interested in in the employment um, in 1921. Yeah, there's, there's, there's lots in there. It's, it's amazing that the census every decade is slightly different. And the fact that we can see where people work, and, and I've noticed my own great grandparents worked at the same school before they married. That was when I see them in 21. And I assume that must be where they met and fell in love. So it's, it's part, I can see my family story appearing in front of me. Uh, and the 21 census itself wasn't without controversy, was it, Audrey? Um, well, you, 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 mean, you mean the postponement? Um, uh, well, there's, there's the postponement and then there's also uh, a certain Horatio that uh, is... Oh, well, is... That, well, that was entirely to do with the postponement. Yes, I'll try and do the very <laughs> short version. Um, the census was postponed because there was industrial unrest in not, not the entire country, but enough of it to mean that they couldn't get accurate returns. And they, they waited until the last possible minute because postponing a census is a massive logistical nightmare. Uh, but when the decision was made that it had to be postponed, um, then there was all the business of the logistics, which is, you know, that's a whole subject in itself. But um, to defray some of the cost uh, of uh, postponing it and having to, you know, print uh, extra, well, they didn't print the new form because, of course, they still say April the 24th. But um, in, in the past, they'd been uh, offered, uh, you know, Payers Soap, for example, had offered to advertise on the census. And they'd been said, no, no, we don't do that. But in this case, they thought, well, we can make an exception 
because um, this isn't an actual piece of census. It, it's just an, like an addendum slip. It's a wrapper that's going around it. So they found uh, an advertising agency who had a client um, who was perfect for this because he was about to launch a national newspaper and, and uh, you know, a, a mail drop to pretty much every household. It's ideal. Unfortunately for the General Register Office, um, after choosing what they thought was a suitable candidate, um, th this was a man called Horatio Bottomley. Now, he was an MP. He was a very corrupt MP um, and a very dodgy character all round. Uh, as well as being an, uh, uh, a newspaper proprietor, he had a finger in lots of um, you know, less than wholesome businesses. He was a very uh, uh, shady dealer. And even um, more unfortunately for the, the General Register Office, um, all his um, nightmares came to, you know, came at once. And it was actually later in 1921 that he absolutely crashed and burned. He was exposed as a, a fraud and a charlatan. He went bankrupt. He went to prison. Um, and, um, you know, this did not reflect well on you know, the poor old General Register Office. Um, and worse than that, there was a whole, uh, I mean, we've got loads of correspondence that went on for quite a long time. But one of the first things he did straight after the census was find all sorts of reasons not to pay. Uh, and he kept on doing this and there were delaying tactics and the advertising agent said, I can't pay you, Mr. Bottomley hasn't paid me. Um, and this went on and on and on. And eventually in I think 1928, the treasury had had enough and they said, that's it. We're not throwing any more good money after bad in court case after court case. They just wrote the whole thing off. So postponing the census and trying to defray the cost by taking advertising actually ended up um, costing them money. And, uh, you know, it was uh, not good for their reputation. And um, not surprisingly, they, there has never been the slightest suggestion that the, the census should carry advertising ever since then wisely i think i think a tale of political scandal is uh, is almost unheard of it's quite it's quite novel to see it in history because of course that would never happen now and t society's no, moved on so much uh, so uh rose we let's look at some actual census documents because some people might still be waiting and thinking i'm not sure if i want to look at some of these and let's show some people how great these are so we've got some interesting census finds that we can take a look at and if you can talk us through some of these wonderful things that we found we have this one here if you want to go for it rose oh yes of course so uh david lloyd george uh he was prime minister of course at the time and you can see that uh wonderful uh place of work at uh on the right hand side 10 downing street which we've we've circled um for you uh and you can see also his occupation prime minister everyone was illuminated that's that's the sort of the wonderful thing about the 1921 census, any census is, is, is such a great leveller. Everyone's included. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if anybody has anything else to, to add about uh, Lloyd George's census return. Um, actually, I do, because we, we I have just been handling the original of that. Oh, wow. Uh, because we, we had uh, our um, uh, the, uh, Minister of State for, uh, for the Culture, um, you know, he, he was on a visit to us and that, that was one of the things we got out. And Lloyd George, although he was Prime Minister, place of work 10 Downing Street, but he was actually at Chequers that weekend. Uh, so that's rather nice. And purely by chance, uh, I noticed that the page before um, is, is all the, the, the Metropolitan Police contingent, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, Prime Ministerial protection people. So if you get that, uh, that, that schedule up on the screen, and you, you you get the film strip and you go, you know, one schedule back. Um, that's where the policemen are. There were several policemen and some motor drivers. So that, that was quite fun. Um, and we did have the, the return for 10 Downing Street itself, which was, it was all um, uh, it was all domestic servants, all Welsh women. I, I didn't look at that, a colleague did. Uh, but um, yes, I, I like the Lloyd George one. What is the X9 oh, yeah. up in the corner, uh, Audrey? I have document. no idea. I'm, there are all sorts of things so that I've looked at, and I thought, no, these are going to mean something. Um, and you know, it's, it's like in 1911, there were some funny little uh, numbers 
uh, that we didn't know what they were at first and we eventually were able to work it out it was because it, it was to do with the, uh, the fertility question that people had um, answered it wrong so all the schedules were annotated with, a, with an accurate number of children allegedly um, and these things that I, I, I do not know I'm not afraid to admit there are things I don't know but I will find out we, we've got all the um, the, the instructions um, there's a document with a huge document bound book um, that uh, you know has got all the instructions and sample schedules and details of that and we have actually just digitized that and that was just launched on the National Archives website if I'd known that we're going to do that I wouldn't have gone and photographed all those individual pages that I went to the trouble of but it's RG279, and if somebody really wants to spend about a fortnight reading it, um, if you go to Discovery on the National Archives website, RG279, and then you can download it, and it is a free download, but it's a lot of files, and uh, you know I've skim read a small part of the first one, so you need to have a lot of time on your hands, but it does give you the answers to all sorts of things, and maybe if I look long enough, I might find what those uh, time, what that, uh, Cross nine or times nine means. Um, if I do, I think there are yeah. lots of those yeah. There's, there's plenty of, of things that we'll be finding out about the census mm -hmm. for, for years to come. Even though it's now oh, here, yeah. I think it's going to be giving secrets for a long, long oh. time. And um, we've got another one here Sylvanus Percival Vivian. Uh -huh. uh, Rose, do you know much about Sylvanus? You know, I I don't. I would I'd very much like to be enlightened about Sylvanus. I think that might be one for you, Audrey. It is indeed. Um, you you know you're in too deep with family history when you find yourself at a gathering. Um, and I was actually at a Find My Past event, and I was talking to Alex Cox, and you hear the words coming out of your mouth. You know, I think Sylvanus Vivian is probably my second favourite Registrar General. <laughs> did I actually say that? Yes, I did. I was among friends, it was fine. But he was the Registrar General um, at the time of the 1921 census. He'd actually only just taken over at the beginning of the year. It was uh, Sir Bernard Mallet before him. And of course, Sylvanus Vivian was also still Registrar General in 1939. So he was responsible for the 1939 register. He was the um, you know, one of the two really long serving Registrars General. The other one was George Graham, who was my actual favorite. Um, so Sylvanus Vivian, he, I, he was a really interesting man. And um, because I read a lot of what he's written and we actually have um, a recording of the script of his broadcast in 1939, uh, which you know, I found that the text of that, and we got um, someone to read it. And reading this and listening to that, I always pictured him as a rather stern-looking gentleman with a wing collar. And then I saw a photograph of him, and to my delight, he was a stern-looking gentleman with a wing <laughs> collar. But he was an absolutely he was a very smart man. He'd previously been responsible for national insurance, so he really, you know, he had a sort of quite incisive things to say about census taking and register taking. Um, so he was absolutely the right man for the job for 1921. And I'm sure he did a great job in 1931, but we'll never know. Um, and he did a tremendous job in 1939. So that is why he is my second favorite registrar general. Fantastic. It's a good way of showing that everyone's there. And one thing that is always exciting said is this is Sylvanus's handwriting. It's him describing his world, how he saw it. And you can see his signature in the corner so you can trace your finger along that signature of your ancestor or the people that you're obsessed with. I know uh, Mary McKee, who uh, you might have seen on, on news all today talking about the census, it has been very excited about being in the presence of Tolkien's signature and things. And it's just wonderful to get closer to those people that you know the names of and you know the stories so much. And then there's another one here, um, H. Gordon Selfridge. Is anyone really excited want to have a go at, at uh, telling us more about Selfridges? It's going to be me again, isn't it, Mika? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, in, in a former life, um, I worked in retail and specifically in department stores. And I actually had an interview at Selfridges and I didn't get the job, but I don't bear a grudge. Um, and I'm always, I'm very interested in retail history, particularly department stores. And uh, a lot of people are very interested in Mr. Selfridge, especially after the TV series. So I was, I was quite pleased to find him. Uh, so we got him in 1939 as well. 
Uh, but he was just a, such a character, some of the, the big retail entrepreneurs um, of that era and, and thereabouts. Uh, they were the most tremendous showmen, probably hell to live with. Um, but you know, Selfridges, he you know he really brought showbiz to retail. You know, he he, he was an American and he brought um, you know the, the the American way of doing department stores and you know absolutely revolutionised uh, you know department stores um, which had all been rather sedate, basically drapers with really really crowded windows. And he he just uh, made uh, you know the it was as though Selfridges had just just landed from outer space. There was, there'd been nothing like it before, and uh, it's still a pretty impressive building. Uh, and his, you know, his other stories, if you, if you saw the TV series, was uh, you know was quite something. So he, he's always someone I'm quite interested in. It's also it's, it's quite interesting that we've not only got the people that run this, but we also have all of his employees. Many mm. many people who who have you know grandparents and parents who might have worked at Selfridges will find when they go and look at their family's entry that they've got place of work Selfridges, and they'll see the address of the Selfridges store. And so we've got the whole chain of everyone that's employed there in this record set for the first time. Even. Um, uh, not everybody will have been living at home because by th at that time you still had a lot of people who worked in the big department stores were literally living over the shop uh, and that carried on um, well into the 20th century it's quite surprising how long it lasted so sometimes you will see you know draper's assistant draper's assistant draper's assistant and they are literally living above um, you know one of the big uh, famous department stores, which, well, they might still be famous, they might be long gone, but they would have been famous at the time, and they were all along Oxford Street uh, and Kensington High Street. Um, you know, it was the, uh, I think the interwar period was a very, very big um, you know, boom time for, for a lot of department stores. That's a good tip for anyone who's looking for someone they can't find with their families to, to do that as well, that sounds, to try and get hold of them too. Mm. Uh, uh, Mika, can I just add, uh, just yeah. just going back to um, Audrey's comment about RG twenty seven, was it RG twenty seven nine? It was it, Audrey, yes. wasn't it? I, I've, I downloaded that while um, while you were talking, and and I would <laughs> recommend that people do so. It's uh, mm -hmm. six separate downloads. You, so you need to register, go to the National Archives website, mm -hmm. register, um, and then you can uh, go to Discovery and just type in RG twenty seven nine, and you can download all that information mm -hmm. about the sensors. And it is fascinating. There's some great. Um, photos in there of some of the machinery used as well. Oh yeah, yes, yes, that too. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Following up from what you were saying, Paul, uh, I wanted to mention a lot of our, our, our viewers may not know this, but when you actually look at an image, there's a little button down at the bottom called extra materials, which mm -hmm. many of you may not have tried pressing and looking at, because this will give you access to all the other images that are relevant to your actual return you're looking at. And some of them can be really informative as well. There's maps in there, there's the actual information given at the front and so on. So um, do interrogate everything you get when you actually go and have a look at an image. Don't assume just what you're looking at is the only thing you're getting. Yeah. Can I just say, because I've been here, you know, at Q, and we've got lots of people in the reading room sitting on our on, on, at our computers looking at, at the census. Uh, and also we've had people doing it remotely and getting through to us on live chat. And one of the things that, that's come up is um, the design of these schedules for 1921 is they're quite similar to 1911, but one of the big differences is that they don't have the street address in the bottom right hand corner. That's only on the other side of the of the paper. And of course, that's one of the you know, extra materials where I think you can, uh, when you've got an image on the screen, I think you can click the arrow on the right and you'll see it. So um, people say, where do I find the address? Am I missing something? And yes, it's in the transcription, but you can also see it uh, written on the back of the paper. And that's, uh, you know, I think I feel a stock reply coming on because that's a question that maybe we didn't anticipate. But it's <laughs> yeah. one that we've been asked a lot today. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We can see, and we've even got in the same way of employment um, that uh, you know, we've got John Lewis, his 1921 mm -hmm. census record here, 85 years old, still there. These great big institutions like Boots, Sainsbury's, Cadbury, all of these companies that we know and, and love are, are still here. And we can see the, the, the original founders of these kind of places, which is, is really, really mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, and there are some interesting, strange things as well. I mean, here we've got casuals on the road. Uh, from Ashford Police Station, uh, some really interesting things that can come out from from the sides of different things, and and this I think dovetails into a, a bigger.
question that we can we can ask uh, and, and and brian i think you might be best for this um what does the 1921 census tell us about the bigger picture about how britain is changing outside of the those who came back from the first world war and things that happened to them what's happening to to my parents or grandparents when i'm looking at them in the 1921 census Oh, well, there's a lot of big stories and it's very difficult to pick them all out here. But I mean, one of the big stories is, is the growing number of women in the workforce. I mean, there's been a huge, it has been propelled dramatically during the First World War. And as they're being forced back to out of the workplace, there was a reluctance for that to actually take place. And it's really important um, step. But it's not the only big story, I don't think. I mean, the, the uh, transformation of the country. I mean, 1921 is pretty much the peak of the British Empire, you know, it doesn't really ever get there again. It's always it's in a perpetual decline thereafter, uh, and so you you see an awful lot of the evidence of that. I mean, I talked before about the numbers of people who are uh, settling or or uh, born abroad who are settling there, but there's a growing um, number of people who come from those parts of the world which Britain has been running for a long time, and again, not just Ireland, uh, but you know, in India and elsewhere, uh, and that's also an interesting story. Um, which is, is, is quite clear here. I, I think particularly what's interesting about this census, we've talked about it before, but it's worth pointing out again, this employment information, how valuable it is. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just give you a couple of examples of where I think there's real stories here of not just having somebody's occupation, but who they work for. Um, for example, Dame Helen Mirren's ancestor is, uh, was a, a Russian, uh, Peter uh, Mironov. Uh, grandfather, who came to England in 1915 as a diplomat of the imperial court in the Tsar. Um, and of course, he's listed in 1921 as a diplomat, yet he didn't have anybody he worked for because there really wasn't anybody there he could work for. So actually, that, not have that absence of information is almost as telling as anything else. Um, or say T.S. Eliot, the, the famous American um, uh, who was working at that point for a rather mundane job for Lloyds Bank. Uh, because, of course, you know, you don't start out famous. You've got to become famous over time. So uh, and then the last one I include here is another Russian, uh, Lydia Lopakova. I mean, some of you might be aware of her. She was an incredibly famous ballerina of the day. She was a beauty and, and um, uh, broke broke hearts right all across the world. Um, but she was a Russian from Petrograd. Interestingly, actually, because she's of Scottish ancestry, which I hadn't realized. Mm. Um, but she was uh, staying in the Waldorf Hotel in 1921. She lists her occupation as artist, and her employer is all the theaters of Europe. Um, <laughs> anyway, she later she married uh, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, a few years later. Um, but I mean, she's an extraordinary character in her own right. Wow, that's fantastic. And, and how do you think, Paul, this census will change family history? Now, now that this is out there and now that we have this, it, will it be the first starting block or, or where will this come in to someone who's, who's approaching this fresh and wants to use uh, this to, to get into their family history? I think, uh, well, hopefully it will be a starting block for many people. Um, it, there's been so much publicity today about it it's across all the news channels um, and hopefully it will inspire people to find something out about their ancestors 100 years ago doesn't seem that long ago to me now having looked at, at my own ancestors in 1911 and you know back to 1841 so 1921 seems quite recent so so hopefully that will stimulate people um but i think um for others, as as we've talked about, you've get you've got that additional information. You don't have that information that you had on 1911 about the disability or about the number of children mm. born, num number still living. You, you, you know, there are some things that are on 1911 which are useful to us as historians, which don't appear on 1921. But then you do have that other information. You have uh, you know, my my great uncle, another another Nixon. Uh, uh, my grandfather's brother, Sid, uh, is found on on the 1921 census, living with um, with his wife and two children, but uh, later that year he would divorce um, and you do see divorces uh, for the first time on, on this census as well so you get all that mm -hmm. additional information that personal information both employer both um, you get the, the the years the age is expressed in years and months um, you get whether the children are in full-time education or part-time education um, yeah, my, my grandmother my maternal grandmother was nine um, she was going to school but um, it's ostensibly in full-time education but sharing a pair of shoes with her sister so she would go one day and wear the shoes and her, her sister would go the following day and, and wear the same pair of shoes that won't be on the census of course but but to see that I've, those are stories that have been handed down to me over, over the years but there's so much information there so these little extra layers which you uh, can piece into your 
into your family tree. I, I just think it's fascinating, really. Yeah, it's a, it's a big thing. And I, I'm going to pull back to some of your comments and questions just because I know you've all been watching so 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 wonderfully. And I've seen you all talking to each other, which is great because it's not just us here. There's uh, the wonderful Ellie in the comments helping answer things. And then I've seen many of you answering each other's questions, which is great. Uh, the first question, I think, would be perfect for you, Rose. Uh, Dear Myrtle has asked, how was the 1921 census indexed? Was it OCR, which is optical character recognition for those who aren't in the know, uh, or perhaps with human oversight, or, or what happened? Tell us, tell us how it worked. Uh, well, it was it was actual humans who transcribed um, the census for us. Uh, very very experienced uh, team. Uh, sometimes uh, up to about three hundred and fifty people at any one time uh, transcribing for us with extensive training. Um, I mean, Paul, you you were you were instrumental along with our colleague. Uh, uh, Stephen Rigdon in um, creating uh, especially bespoke and incredibly thorough keying rules, uh, which were, which uh, instructed uh, the, the keying team um, with, with the task of transcribing those uh, 38 million names. It's, it's a big thing to ask. And, 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 and for those of you who are so excited about 1921 census, you're waiting with bated breath for the next census. Uh, uh, Paul, the first question is from how, and she says, does any of the 1931 census still exist? If we're waiting for that census, when are we going to get it? And if not, what, what else can we use? Oh, well, I don't believe it does exist, does it? It was burnt. It was, um, it was the, somebody, cigarette accidentally set light to the lot, I think, and it all went up in smoke. Um, so, so no, that doesn't exist. And, and neither does 1941, which wasn't taken because of the Second World War. So the next one is going to be the, the 1951 census, which won't be released until 2052. So there's a, <laughs> there's a long wait. So, um, but, you know, it, what, what do we have in the meantime? Well, there'll, there'll be electoral uh, roles and registers there's uh, the, there's newspapers of course there'll be who knows what else is out there for that matter i mean i i never cease to be amazed actually at, at what a rich resource we have in this country despite you know records having been lost and uh, weeded o over the years there's still a lot out there but in terms of census um the next one is the, is the 1952 census so so this is the last census release for for some considerable time makes it all the more special and important that this one is, is here and it, it means that it's just so much more magical to find your relatives and ancestors knowing that we've got quite a lot a, such a big gap to find them and it's maybe the, the last census you'll find them in um you know in in their lifetimes that's the big thing and uh, a, a good comment from uh, philip mcgavin uh, who would recommend searching these addresses in the newspapers as well in case your family's mentioned that our newspapers are wonderful they're so big and so useful and they're a great extra resource so uh, always keen to see people talk about those uh, we've got um, a few other comments uh, louise has said that it's absolutely amazing what fire and fast have done with getting this out there for us all keep up the good work so that's some applause because of course this is a massive project where everyone has been involved uh, audrey on the national archive side you know the rest of us here and many people that aren't on this uh, presentation and and aren't you know in front of a news camera who are tirelessly working some of them haven't been to bed yet you know they're still working through to make sure that this is perfect for you to have that wonderful moment at home to find your ancestors and see things just at the touch of a button wherever you are in the world whether you're in the united states canada australia you can see that because there's someone who's been doing this uh, that you'll never see uh, but that all their work is so so important and uh, there's a few uh, comments about the census itself uh, Anne has said in the few records she's used it's made her realize what a great difference the war had made to families and the way people had to live that was a a really a, a big poignant thing joan has uh, found Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It's Sherlock Holmes's birthday today, which uh, I didn't know that. And uh, he's in the census. Well, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is. I don't know where Sherlock Holmes might be. <laughs> but um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is in Sussex, if anyone wants to take a look. Um, Joan has said that her great grandfather was a chemical thermometer maker. More confirmation that she's got the right family. He had the same occupation in the 1911 census. So a good way of using that occupation to make sure you've got the right person. And a bit of a story from Leslie. Lloyd George was visiting my grandfather. So that we saw Lloyd George's census entry before. And my dad thought he could get away with smoking. Grandfather excused them both and chucked my dad out never saw him again i don't know if that means you never saw lloyd george again or you never saw your, your member of the family um but 
uh, what a, an amazing connection to these these people who are so involved in history. So it's really nice to hear and see that. And as we get towards the top of the hour and, and the end of our wonderful hour session, which I know we could keep talking and talking, and it's it's one of those things where it's quite hard to, to get genealogists to stop talking once we get going. So we could we could easily go on for six or seven hours. I wanted to ask each of you two questions. And the, the questions, if you can answer them both at once, um, is do, what is your, your sort of final best favorite tip for making the most out of the 1921 census and what is your favorite story or discovery in the census it doesn't have to be your own family it could doesn't have to be you know yeah you know, it, it can be funny poignant upsetting anything and you can think of what is the thing that you could you say will sum up the 1921 census for you so so those two i think audrey if you'd like to go first yeah, I knew you were going to pick on me first, because yeah. um, you know I'm never short of something to say. Um, my, oh, before I say anything at all, I didn't know my friend dear Myrtle was there, so hello. <laughs> um, the the one of the things that I find in the uh, you know when searching the census is that because I'm poking around and you know just trying different things and obviously not to my family because they're not there, and um, but I found because there are so many fields that are indexed, you absolutely do not want to search loads and loads at one time. But some of the, I found some of the um, slightly unexpected ones very useful. Um, somebody had a question just this afternoon about people in institutions. And I was doing a little bit of exploring and I could do that. We're just yeah, putting in a sample surname um, and restricting it to the schedule type. So I could do I, 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 and I, I, I. Um, if I wanted just just to see people in, in institutions and I didn't realize how useful that was going to be and I've used it quite a few times uh, so so that's uh, you know that's a slightly unexpected one that I found and um, the, the the rather fun thing that I found and I found quite a few interesting things but just um, because anybody who's ever been to the National Archives will know that you cannot approach this building without going past the, the all our wonderful swans and assorted other uh, wildlife and uh, I just totted out and I was just looking to see how many people in 1921 were called swan or goose or heron I found quite a lot um, among the uh, the people called goose none of them was from Canada which is a shame um, <laughs> but, uh, the, the very first swans I looked at it was a whole family um, except that Mr and Mrs Swan had gone to Italy it says um, so uh, I, I, I thought, oh, that, that's interesting. So they've, you know, they've flown off and, oh, hang on, can't be for the winter because it was in June. But, uh, I, but you know, the, the, the swans just amused me. Uh, the <laughs> one so they swanned off, had they, Audrey? They oh, off, yeah. oh so, that's uh, wonderful. <laughs> what about you, Paul? Oh, well, I would just go back to what I said earlier and, and just familiarise. I think, uh, um, as Audrey says, there's, there's so many different search boxes on, on there. So so get familiar with that. Um, remember, searching is free. So you, so you can search for free. Um, see what comes up. Uh, if it's not what you'd expect, if you look at the number of results and it's not what you'd expect, try try something else. Try different combinations. Try mm -hmm. try different uh, words in, in different search fields. Um, so so that, that's that. And But also, as I say, read do read the uh, instructions. I think the temptation is, we've waited for this for so long, those of us at Find My Past and National Archives have been actually working on it for, for well over three years. Um, mm. The temptation is to rush straight in. Don't do that. Just bite your lip. Keep your fingers off the keyboard. Just read the, read the, read the notes. Uh, understand it uh, and use that instruction that has been written at, uh, at great length and in great detail, but in a very readable way. Um, mm. Understand it and then use that information to um, uh, to inform your search. Um, in, in terms of um, the best thing that I found, I guess I suppose it's early, very early days for me, very early days. But as I say, all, all that information about my my family, looking at where they worked, uh, who they worked with, um, their ages uh, in months, I, I just think the detail is tremendous. Uh, it's detail you don't find on other returns. 
That's great. That's it. It's it's uh, it's good. I think all of this advice is really really helpful, and I'm hoping that uh, after this presentation finishes, some of you will get to our Find My Pass forum and tell us about the great things you found or tweet about them. Make sure to tag us and hashtag 1921 Census. And we've been having so much fun and, and enjoying your discoveries as much as you have been. To know that all this work that's gone into this to create this thing has has created so many happy moments. So definitely let us know. It's been a wonderful thing. Rose, what what is your final tip and favorite census entry um, so mine are linked uh my top tip is make use of wildcard searching so wildcard is where you use your little asterisks mm -hmm. so you can start typing a name so for example the surname i look for my family name Staveley, and that can sometimes get a bit muddled up uh for stanley so i could type for example sta and then put an asterisk and that will return uh, names like Stanley, Staverly, etc. Um, so through that, I was able to locate my uh, Staverly great, great grandmother. She wasn't where I was, ex was expecting her to be uh, in, in Yorkshire. She was actually in Manchester. And this was this this discovery just really delighted me. Um, the family was living in a terrace house in Manchester and I just happened to click into the next household and it was a family of Japanese music hall artists. Um, so I was able to trace their journey um, through the UK. Uh, I just thought how wonderful and, and cosmopolitan um, that street must have been. Um, uh, yeah, just a fantastic find. That's, that is really good. That's it's interesting. And when you do look at the census on that film strip on the image, if you look at the next one along to the right, you'll see the, the other side of your census entry. And that gives you the address as well, which is really important. So you can see the house name, the house and the details and the detail of the person that filled this in as well if you can't read it. So that's another thing to definitely use that film strip and to look at other parts too. Brian, what is your final tip and favourite uh, record that you found? Oh, two, two very small things, and they're largely echoing what everybody else has just said. But the first thing is, is that we've made this as, as easy as we possibly can for you to use this census, but it's still a piece of research, you know? We haven't done it all the work for you, nor do I think all of you would want us to do all the work for you. You need to get d dug into this source yourself. You need to do the research. Um, you, I, I can just tell from, I know so many names for actually listening. You're all experienced family history enthusiasts. You know what you're at. We've made it as, as easy as we can, but you, we can't do it all for you. Um, uh, so there's a lot. To, look, take the advice from Paul and Rose uh, and, and Audrey. The other thing I'd say is, is be curious about the, the wider world rather than just your own family. I mean, this is an opportunity to actually, as, as Audrey was saying, spy on your neighbors. Go and find out. I don't know about the rest of you, but I come from a country where a huge amount of what happened in the past was hidden, it was considered to be embarrassing or was considered to be uh, not respectable or god knows what else this is a time to uncover that history and celebrate it so you know have fun with it that's great that's really good um, and uh, any favorites that have come to mind or uh, still looking Oh, there's so many, which which I'm, I'm still looking at. I'm discovering so many interesting people all the time, largely speaking because at the moment I'm trying to discover more about uh, people from abroad who, who in, in England and Wales, and, and I'm discovering a huge amount that I just didn't know about the character of the country at the time, um, largely speaking because it wasn't part of the public image. Um, it never was until much, much more recently. Um, so it's, 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 it's quite an eye-opener. I think it's it's worth mentioning when we talk about people of other nationalities in the England and Wales 1921 census. Only today I was just looking at uh, a family in Wortley in Yorkshire whose nationality is Yorkshireman. And uh, it's a wonderful uh, family there that I was very happy to find those and, and I knew that I would find at least one family like that and it's a, a testament to wonderful Yorkshire pride so that's great and um, there are a few uh, comments about how great this is and how wonderful and, and thanks to all of us and and, and also to, to the panel and, and to the final pass team um, Chris has spent weeks getting everything they could on their Jones relative and they found them in two searches so that shows even with a name like Jones if you do a bit of preparation you plan use all the records 
perhaps to get things as they should be, then you still can find those missing ancestors. That's great. And then there are a few, just uh, three comments I picked out to, to round us off to show how all the stuff that we've talked about has been connected. Teresa's children's surname is Bottomley. So maybe she has a connection to the infamous Horatio. So that's something where maybe, I don't know if you'd be bragging about that at parties, but that's something there to think about. Um, and then um, Michael has said that their mother's headmistress was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's sister. And his mother lunched with him on three occasions. And his father is Lloyd George. Uh, his, my fa his father's oh. dancing partner was Lloyd George's daughter. So we connected both of those two things together. And if that's not enough, then we have Andrew Patterson that has had, had a look in the census. And he can see at least seven people called Sherlock Holmes with an age low enough to be named after the character. So even though Sherlock Holmes was written about and made as a story, um, there are people that were inspired enough to bring that forward and to make that part of their family history. So there are many ways that all of these things can echo, come back full circle and uh, and be uh, something for all of us to enjoy in, in different ways. Uh, it's been a wonderful session. I think we've got to round it off now and, and thank everyone who's been here and thank all of you as well for, for watching because uh, we, we couldn't do this without you. And I said it's been wonderful to see all of your tips and all your comments as well as things have gone through. Um, a, we are off to uh, some of us to to go to bed after a long session of keeping all this thing others to to get back into the 1921 census and find more wonderful things and we hope that you also will be going and looking and finding some great stuff and definitely tell us all about what you found too uh, it's really exciting to to see that happen so thanks very much for joining us it, tomorrow you will see uh, myself and Jen Baldwin having a very special themed Find My Past Friday as we will be again talking about some great things that have been released this week. Who knows what records in the family history world have been released this week we might want to talk about. So there'll be some great things and more things to do and maybe bring those things to uh, the, that Friday. If you found some great stuff, you can talk to us there as well. And we'll again be sharing tips and tricks and more things. Uh, but uh, apart from that, I just want to thank everyone here. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Audrey. Um, it's been wonderful. Um, and thank you all for coming. We hope to see you again very, very soon. Have fun with the 1921 census. It's on farmapass.co.uk. Really easy to get started and enjoy the other many billions of records available as well. And uh, we can't wait to see what we discover. Thank you very, very much. And see you again. Take care.